If you would like, go ahead and grab a Bible, turn it on, whatever you'd like to do. We are going to jump into the Word today. I have my friendly little catch mic. I'm noticing a dynamic. The, spa- the splash zone is getting further and further away. That must mean that you want me to be that much closer to you. Or that, or you don't like this catch mic and you want to stay as far away from it as possible. Uh, if this is your first time or you're newer, welcome. Uh, we do like to interact, engage, not just listen, but to have a conversation, a dialogue. We are in a series this year called Jesus Centered. And as a network, um, we've been exploring what it means to have Jesus at the center of our lives personally, for us as a microchurch community, and for us as people in Jesus' kingdom. We've talked about a lot of things, but last month, I think, struck a chord with some folks. Last month, we talked about Jesus being the center of politics. And of course, you can always check that out on our YouTube channel if you weren't here. But I thought it was worth repeating some of the main points that we discussed last month as we prepare to launch into today. Last month, we discussed this idea in 1 Peter that says we're aliens and foreigners in the kingdoms of the world, which includes America, and how this should directly impact our involvement and even our uninvolvement in the political and civic arenas. As aliens and strangers in the world, we talked about turning off our TVs and understanding that media in our capitalist society does not have your best interest in mind. We discussed the fact that if you do decide to involve yourself in the voting process, that as a Christian, you shouldn't vote selfishly, but rather consider others' interests and not just your own, as the Bible teaches us in Philippians 2. Then we closed by talking about awaiting the king because the kingdom of God is ultimately something that we await, not something we create. Though Jesus has come and ushered in the kingdom of God, we still await the kingdom's final realization. This is known as the already but not yet. The kingdom of God has already come in Jesus but not yet come fully in Jesus. The kingdom of God is ultimately not something we can create through our political activism alone. We live as followers of Jesus and bring his kingdom on earth in all the ways that we can, but we recognize that these ways are limited and only Jesus can fully bring about his own kingdom. This is important as we lean into today, Jesus, the center of mission. Let's actually read in Genesis chapter 1. Thank you for teeing that up for me, Kim. Genesis chapter 1. So, the mission of God, because I want to start there, right? Because we could delineate the mission of people, the mission of a person, individual, country, nation, whatever, the mission of God. We're going to talk about the mission of God today. And I want to start by helping us to understand the mission of God as presented in the scriptures. The narrative and the story of the scriptures actually present a consistent message, a consistent story of what God's mission is. And so if we look in the first page of the Bible, in Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you flip to the very last page of the story, Go to Revelation chapter 22. The first page and the last page of the Bible give us an arc, a storyline of this mission of God. It says in Revelation 22, verse 5, There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord will be, I'm sorry, the Lord will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. So the story of the mission of God in the scriptures is that God is a creator God that creates all things, and the end of the story is that God, they, God and people, will reign over his creation forever and ever. 
This is the story of the Bible. It's about the mission of God to reign over his creation with his created image bearers forever and ever. The beginning of that story has happened. The end has not. And we're in the middle somewhere. Well, maybe not the middle. We're at the end already, but not yet. The very fact that we have a Bible is part of the mission of God. God is communicating and revealing himself to his creation over generations and millennia. And so this mission of God is about God being a creator and God wanting to reign over this creation together in partnership with his image bearers. It's important to frame this narrative, this mission of God, and that actually the Bible is one part of that mission to communicate and to invite us to be part of and co-labor and co-heirs and co-reigners with him over this creation. So in Colossians chapter 1, Jesus is going to enter this narrative. Or not enter, but this idea of how does Jesus enter into this narrative of the mission of God, we see in Colossians chapter 1, if you want to turn over there. In verse 19, it says, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that is Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus enters this mission of God as being the fullness of God dwelling with us as a person. And that through this person that God dwells in, God's mission to reconcile everything back to himself is being accomplished through Jesus' blood on the cross. Right in his book, Mission of God, he says the entire Bible delivers to us the whole counsel of God, the plan, the purpose, and mission of God for all of creation, and that it will be reconciled to God through Christ by the cross. That seems like a funny apparatus to reconcile things together. A death on a cross, torture, murder. That's the reconciliation apparatus. That's the tool to reconcile all things. That's a great mystery that I have no kind of time or mind to wrap around. But have you ever heard the saying that a Christian is so heavenly-minded they're of no earthly good? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that. It's a saying that means Christians ain't about nothing. They're so heavenly-minded they're of no earthly good, meaning they're so caught up in outside the earth, right, the afterlife, heaven, death, that they aren't doing anything of any good for the here and now. That is an indictment that has been made against some Christians. The earliest Christians were far from that. They were not so heavenly minded that they were of no earthly good. In fact, they demonstrated that those who were genuinely heavenly minded, they were the very people who were deeply committed to doing God's will on the earth. And God's will is that all things would be reconciled back to himself. And so these Christians were concerned with things like labor relations, slavery, marriage and family, the exposure of children, cruelty in the amphitheater and the gladiatorial games, obscenity on the stage and in the theater. They were radical peacemakers in a world of violence. And as aliens and strangers in this world, they proclaimed a conviction, no blood but our own. These early Christians were a part of this mission of God to reconcile all things back to himself. And the way that they did that, the way that they co-labored in this mission with God, is they had this radical life 
as aliens and strangers. And Michael Green, in his book, Evangelism in the Early Church, he says, the earliest Christians were concerned about this life without feeling that to leave it was the greatest of all evils. And such an attitude is sufficiently rare in any age to excite notice. Let that sink in for just a moment. The mission of God today for us means that we are concerned about issues of life and death, incarceration and poverty, education and equality, environmentalism, and stewarding what God has entrusted us with as we act as the salt and light of the earth. It means that we do not fear death because we're convinced of our own resurrection from the grave. And this primary conviction will always get noticed in a world that is so preoccupied with trying to limit suffering and death. We spend billions on anti-aging creams and Botox. We try to download our consciousness onto hard drives so that when we figure out our meat sack problem, we can just upload our consciousness into a new body and effectively live forever. These are pipe dreams. Christians don't fear death. They celebrate it. Paul is explicit we don't mourn like those of the world. And I think this is where the rubber meets the road for us in the mission of God. Do we believe in the resurrection from the dead? The only way to live forever is through the one who's already conquered death. The only way to not fear death is to be reconciled to God through Jesus and therefore to be set free from our fear of death because we're confident and believe in our own resurrection. But God's mission is unhurried and unstoppable. Patience was one of the key ingredients to the mission of the early church. The early Christians, they were patient as they lived lives of holiness and love amongst their neighbors and as they trusted in God. As Michael said, it wasn't that they understood the theological narrative and doctrinal truths so much better than their neighbors, though they did teach their neighbors. Their greatest ingredients of being on mission was to live a life of love, a way to love that was radically set apart from every other way of love, a la Jesus saying, even the pagans do that. You love even your enemies. And there were faithful and effective missionaries in the scriptures like Paul and Silas and Timothy. And they boldly preached a message of repentance to turn to Christ in faith and in baptism. And ordinary Christians and disciples did the same. These Christians, they understood that the mission of God was to be something that they were partnering with God in, co-laboring even alongside God in his purposes to reconcile all things back to himself. They were able to participate, but they didn't feel like they were solely responsible to accomplish God's mission. Paul refers to this in his letter to Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3. What does he say? He said, as people are coming to Christ, they're starting to divide with each other over which leader they're connected with and who baptized them. And he says, we plant and water, but God makes it grow. Paul understood himself to be a co-laborer with God. Not that he was the one doing all the work and making things grow. It was a partnership. And that partnership at times is mysterious. Where does the watering stop and the growing from God begin? Does the growing from God happen without watering and planting? There is some mystery in this co-laboring. But one thing we know is it's not either or. It's both and. Look over in Acts chapter 26. 
As we're thinking about Jesus being the center of mission, I want to talk about this for a moment. Acts chapter 26, we get a glimpse into Paul as this missionary, this person who's on mission with God, co-laboring with God, planting and watering. In chapter 26 and verse 20, He says, first to those in Damascus, where he first met the resurrected Lord, then to those in Jerusalem, when I went there, and all Judea, and then even to the Gentiles outside of the land of Israel, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. And then if you turn over to chapter 17, we see Paul proclaiming, partnering, co-laboring with this mission there as well, but to a different audience. He's now talking to the Athenians, and he says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, referring to the Athenian pantheon worship of these false gods. He says, God overlooked such ignorance in the past, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Paul and the early Christians, they believed in the finality of Jesus. They lived their lives according to that belief. And then they urged other people to convert to Jesus, to point towards Jesus, to turn to Jesus, and they saw themselves as participating in and forwarding God's mission for all of creation. When we're a part of what happens in people's lives, like Jessica, like Katie, we are partnering with God in his purposes to reconcile all of creation. Their hopeful expectation of the resurrection is what enabled this. Their faith in the resurrection is what fueled their mission and their evangelism. Paul said to Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, without the resurrection of the dead, this is all just the biggest lie ever, and we're the biggest idiots on the planet. It's all centered on their faith in Jesus raising from the dead. And if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, if you don't believe in an afterlife, if you don't believe in heaven and hell, there isn't much motivation to be on mission with God. Your mission will be to make this life as comfortable as you can. And you may be noble and try to make it more comfortable for some others, but you won't be on mission with God who is looking to reconcile all things to himself. And as a microchurch network, you know, we've been very clear about our goals from the beginning. Our two primary goals of microchurches are what? Who can say them? Mission and maturity. We've been very clear about this. It's been on the internet for years. It's the first video people see when they walk through the door of our website. Mission and maturity. Microchurches do not exist to give you something to do on your weekend that's better than your favorite hobby or maybe equally with your favorite hobby. It's hard to choose sometimes on that Sunday morning, isn't it? Like, oh, I could be out. What is it for you? Our microchurches exist in order to be on mission with God and with one another, to love God a lost and dying world, to love others that are not like us and to become more like Jesus together. The first place we have to learn to love others that are not like us is probably our microchurch. These two goals of mission and maturity, they're not independent from one another. As we grow to become more like Jesus We will grow in joining God and co-laboring with him in his mission to reconcile all things. When we're not maturing, when we're not becoming more like Jesus, you know what happens? We tend to not be on mission. And instead, 
we tend to complain. Church becomes about us and our needs and what we think should happen. Rather than helping other people, rather than proclaiming a message of salvation and love through Jesus, we start complaining that church isn't what I want. It doesn't give me enough relationships. It doesn't give me the relationships with the type of people I want. You can go to Google or Facebook and find people just like you. The world is very good at that. We are very good at that. I could go on and enumerate other ways that we tend to make church about us, but I believe your imagination can cover the bases. Second Peter chapter 1. Peter says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a life of godliness through Christ Jesus our Lord, who through our knowledge of him has called us by his own glory and goodness. And through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Either God has given you everything you need for a life that is godly in Jesus, or he hasn't. Either God has given us everything we need to live a godly life in Jesus, or he hasn't. I call this the Jesus plus syndrome. You know, as Christians, we start to fall into this Jesus plus trap. Like, Jesus isn't enough anymore. Now I need, you know, better singing, and now I need somebody to feed me spiritually, and now I need better sermons, and now I need... Do you? Because I read that Jesus is enough, and we don't need anything else to live a godly life. So please don't fall prey to the lie that you need something in addition to Jesus to live a godly life and to be on mission with God in the reconciliation of all things. I think a great litmus test for us is that if we find ourselves unhappy, unsatisfied, discontent with church, you know, for whatever reason, ask yourself if you've been on mission. Have you been helping someone to repent and turn to God to be reconciled to God, to become a follower of Jesus. I have found that in my own life, these two things often go hand in hand. When I'm not partnering, watering, planting with God in his mission, I'm not in front of the people that he's wanting to reconcile and all the traps and snares and entanglements that sin and the world and Satan has on folks, I lose touch with what God saved me from. And I start to get entitled. And I start to think it's more about me. And I start to complain. And I start to think about what I don't have rather than the gratitude that springs up from knowing that God has reconciled me to him and I want to love others in a similar way. You know, and I think for some of us as we consider the mission of God, Perhaps it means that we need to learn for the first time what it means to truly become a follower of Jesus, not just a believer or a churchgoer or something that the culture recognizes as Christian, but a disciple of Jesus. And sometimes this is in spite of our good intentions, our sincerity of heart. Sometimes it is about hearing a biblical gospel for the first time. You know, Michael Thompson shared earlier, he's now in Eastern Europe trying to partner with God on the mission to reconcile all things. Ask Michael what it means to think that you're a Christian and to go to church and then be called to repent and become a disciple of Jesus, being willing to give up everything, go anywhere, and do anything for Jesus. We have fallen prey to this trap that we think, oh, there's Christians and then there's really disciples, you know, like the zealous ones who will go anywhere. No, no, there's no bifurcation in the scriptures. You're a follower of Jesus or you're not. 
And every follower of Jesus is willing to surrender to him as Lord, which means go anywhere, do anything, give up everything. There is no secondary admittance into the kingdom of God except for through a complete and total surrender to the lordship of Jesus. And frankly, most people haven't heard that gospel. They've heard an easy believism, cheap grace. Sure, pray Jesus into your heart and go live however you want. You're good. You're not. They're not. We're not. I'm not. For some of us, though, we may have never even heard much about the Bible or Christianity. We may have a stifled faith or we may have been hurt by church. Whatever the case is, as a community, we want to sit down. We want to open up the scriptures. We want to walk together to learn and explore and invite an openness to following Jesus and why Jesus is the greatest thing you could ever devote your life to. And so if this is one of your first times, you're newer here, welcome. And you may have noticed that we don't do like an altar call. We don't tell people to accept Jesus at the end of the sermon. That's because I don't believe this is how disciples are made. Jesus calls us to estimate the cost before we become his follower. As we consider Jesus being at the center of mission, I want to invite all of us to ask ourselves, are we co-laboring with God in his mission or have we twisted his mission to think that it's become about us? God's mission is to reconcile all things. That doesn't stop when he reconciles us. And if you haven't been reconciled to God, obviously we want to help you. And we want to pray and encourage you in that journey. For us to become a Jesus-centered people, a Jesus-centered community and microchurch network, it means that we allow Jesus to be at the center of what we understand God's mission to be, that we're co-laboring with God. We're co-laboring with each other towards the goal of God's mission, which is the reconciliation of all things. Let's close in prayer together.